Hello and welcome to this week's episode of Nucleus Investment Insights. In today's episode, we'll talk about the rental crisis and its effect on the Australian economy. It's no secret that the Labor government is running the highest immigration policy in history, and this has fueled a rental crisis. This is extremely untimely considering inflation is already high and the other costs of living have also skyrocketed. Today, we're going to discuss not only this, but all the other flow-on effects it's having on the Australian population and the economy. Just a quick reminder, this podcast is general advice only and is not intended to be specific to your personal situation. If you do want to discuss your personal financial situation and how to improve that, you can book a call with me or one of the advice team at nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact. Today, as always, we have Nucleus Wealth's Chief Investment Officer and Co-Founder, Damien Klassen. Damo, welcome back. Hey, Tim. Hey, gang. Good, thanks. Today, we also have Nucleus Wealth's Chief Economist, Leif Van Onselen. Uh, Leif, welcome back. It's been a while. Yeah, it has been a while. Great to be back. Thanks for having me. Yeah, pleasure. Uh, my name's Sam Kerr. I'm the Head of Advice at Nucleus Wealth. We are live every Thursday at 12.30 Australian Eastern Standard Time. So jump onto the Nucleus Wealth YouTube channel and you can ask any questions that come to mind and we'll do our best to answer them during the show. We are also available on all other major podcast platforms, so feel free to have a listen there if you prefer also. Just a reminder that the themes discussed in this podcast are a reflection of our thinking that we implement across all our portfolios. So if the themes resonate, you can find out more in the description notes. One other thing, until the end of the year, we are offering a free no obligation super review. Uh, we'll give you a super health check. Uh, we'll give you clarity on how you're invested, the fees you're paying, and also the tax saving strategies on offer. So you can book in via nucleuswealth.com forward slash contact as well. So that's the formalities out of the way. Damo, over to you to get the discussion rolling. Thanks. Yeah, it's been a little while since we've done a, uh, had a look at property. So, uh, we thought we we should check back in and and I think the the themes are pretty similar to what we've been talking or well, what we were talking about last time was this this wave of immigration um, pushing up rents and um, uh, I guess the the interest rates had sort of largely stopped rising at least until um, you know a month or two ago uh, and so that's sort of um, we're really just waiting for the effects of that to to, st to start flowing through and, and seeing what's what's happening so. Yeah, with that, um, let's uh, let's switch to Leith, and uh, he's prepared a number of charts, and let's talk through what you've got to say. Yeah, thanks, Dan, mate. Look, um, you know, it's be you know, you basically have to be buried under a rock if you don't know we've got a bit of a housing crisis at the moment, and it's basically played out there in the uh, in the rental market. So, um, you probably all read the headlines about you know massive shortages in rental properties, people being forced out to live in their cars, into group housing, and all this sort of stuff, and basically, you know. The, the root cause of that is effectively a massive population surge that Australia has experienced over the past 18 months. Now, um, the, the, the official demographic data from the ABS uh, is only current to March. So it's, you know, it's about six months lagging. But what that showed is that Australia grew by 563,000 people in the year to March, which was off the charts, numbers we've never seen before. And that was off uh, net overseas migration of 454,000. Now, it was only the May budget that the uh, the federal federal um, government or the Australian Treasury predicted that net overseas migration last financial years. So that's you know the year to June. And sorry, and we, just just to put this into perspective. So we you, we you know our longer term average is sort of 80 to 100,000. Yeah. So well, I mean, it depends so how far you want to go back. Average. Yeah. So so if you want to go back to federation, it's about you know 80,000. Yeah, uh, since the Second World War, it's about ninety odd. Um, well, I mean, Second World War through to about two thousand and five before it ramped. Yeah, was about that. that. But since, um, but uh, fifteen years pre COVID, it then jumped to about two hundred and twenty. So we had we had a massive step up, and now now we're running at, uh, yeah. you know, basically the last financial year. Uh, if you if you you know uh, use the national accounts population numbers, which was six hundred twenty six thousand, and you know, you sort of work backwards from there. We're, we're looking at uh, net overseas migration uh, last financial year of about 500,000. And just to put that in perspective, that the, the, the highest under the previous government, so the previous, uh, um, you know, 2000 and was it, they, they came in uh, 2013 uh, to last year. 
um, was 260,000 in one year. Uh, that was their highest ever. The, the highest previously before the most recent boom was 310,000 under Kevin Rudd. Uh, and we're at basically you know, half a million, although it hasn't been officially confirmed. So we're not, that, that won't get confirmed until December yeah. when, when the but, uh, official data comes out, but it's off the charts. Yeah. So effectively, um, though, you know, from, you know, if you picked, say, from the 80s and 90s or whatever, you basically, okay, so, so from about, um, so roughly from the financial crisis, following the financial crisis, we doubled our immigration, overall immigration, and now we've doubled it again. Yeah, basically. Wow. basically. So, so, that, so there's, a, there's a chart there on the left. Uh, which basically plots Australia's net overseas migration, so into March, obviously, yeah, uh, all the way back to Federation. You can see it's just it's just launched, and I haven't included this chart in here, but you know, there's there's, just, there's often this um, this claim that oh, we're just catching up for lost COVID migration because immigration turned negative briefly. That's actually not true, um, according to the you know civilian population figures that are presented in the uh, monthly AB, uh, ABS labour force data. We've already caught caught back up to where the trend population growth had we not had the pandemic. So we've already caught, fully caught caught up with the so-called lost migration. And from now forward, uh, from going forward, we're going to be basically running way ahead of what the run rate would have been had we not had the pandemic. And, and I think as well, just to, just to make sure we've, we've covered this off, because it's uh, it's not that we're... And, and I guess it's, it's not that there's a, a particularly anti-immigration stance from anyone. All, all, all this is about saying is, is that... Um, I guess in in my my take is that you know you can look at things and you can say okay should we have um, zero immigration and I think most people will go no we shouldn't have Im- zero immigration should we have ten million people a year immigration people will go well no no ten million is too much you know if we're bringing in fifty percent of the population every year we can't possibly handle that and you're like okay great so what all we're doing really is is arguing about a number what's the right number because I think there's some people sort of put it out as the thing of going all immigration is good immigration and to me, if we're building, if you've already built, if you're if you were factoring in that you're going to have 10 million people and you're building cities and roads and everything was already done before that and they're rolling up and, and into the things, great, you know, go for it. But it's the problem is we're not actually doing that. We're just going, bring people in and good luck. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, I, I largely agree with you, but the problem is there is also a natural environment question. And yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And, and, you know, the, 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 the so-called intergenerational report of the environment, which is called the State of the Environment Report, Basically, it came out in 2021. It comes out every uh, five years or so. Basically, said that population growth is the biggest risk for the environment. So, I mean, you don't have to be a rocket scientist. Like we're short, uh, we, we're structurally short of water everywhere. We've obviously had three years of the Nina, it's all the dams are full. But you know, uh, there's, there's, there's there's already artic- articles coming out left, right, and centre across the media saying that Sydney's going to have a severe water problem in three years if we have you know any kind of below average rainfall. Uh, and we're going to have to build desal plants everywhere. Uh, so, you know, there, there is a carrying capacity of the of, of the country, and I'd argue Australia is probably pretty close to that already. And we're going to the intergenerational report says we're going to grow fifty percent, so thirteen million people: Sydney, Melbourne, Brisbane, and Adelaide in just forty years. That's just bonkers, and, the, and, and it's going to absolutely destroy the environment as well as living standards. So, I mean, people always forget about the environment, environmental impact. And I think that's, uh, it can't be forgotten, that's all. But yeah, I mean, I certainly get your point. Um, my, my view is that we had a pretty successful immigration program up to about the mid-2000s when we decided to ramp it. So that should be the level. So it should be around that sort of, you know, 120,000 a year, which it was in the uh, early 2000s. Uh, and that, that level, we seem to be able to cope pretty well. I mean, I can't remember too many people complained about it around about the Sydney Olympics. Um, but since then, we've just read immigration too hot for about you know really twenty years, just about. Yeah, and, and, and uh, that's the problem. And the big part is it's it's a um, yeah. As I said it's to to me, I've got absolutely no problems running at five hundred if if we're actually building stuff for it and we we're pre we we're pre planning for it. We're actually saying yes. Here's where we we you know we're actually out and building new cities and and you know all the extra stuff that that goes with it and making sure there's roads and hospitals and and all that type of stuff as opposed to just going let's just. Throw, the, throw it open and, and let the state worry about it. Because that's I think that's the other issue, obviously, we've spoken about before on this, but it's worth reiterating is that um, f- federal government gets all the benefits of, of um, immigrants in terms of higher tax take. Um, states have to pay all the costs and you don't get a, there's no sort of transfer back. And, yeah. so, um, and so what states have effectively been doing is selling off assets for the last 20 years to try and um, 
cover the the extra build they need to do. And also building, obviously, toll roads and everything. So, so effectively, you know, 20 years ago, you could drive around Sydney and you paid two tolls if you went over the bridge or near the airport. Now there's like 20 toll roads. And that was pretty much because Sydney's grown by 1.2 million people and got to basically build tunnels everywhere and toll roads everywhere, which you only need to do because you grew population like a science experiment. So it's pushed the cost on the state government. It's also pushed to push it on the individuals who now are driving in more crowded roads than they did 20 years ago and they're paying way more to do so. So there's a broader, so it's pushed the costs. So the federal government collects 80% of the tax revenue. They get all income tax, company tax. They benefit from immigration. The costs are pushed on the states who really have very narrow tax bases, who but they also provide all, uh, they're, they're the key providers of infrastructure, health, services, education, et cetera. And then the way they've done it, as Damo said, is they've sold off a whole bunch of assets. They've also done these public-private partnerships everywhere. So where everything's become user pays, which means individuals, households, are then paying the costs. So it's classic privatise the gains the treasury, socialise the costs and everyone else. And, and it's the same, big business is the same, the um, the property developers. Well, let's, same, except- let's come back to that. So we're not going to use Sam quickly no. for a quick message. And come back to that. We'll be back with the investment insights very shortly. Nucleus Wealth is an active and passive investment manager. If you like what you're hearing and want some help with your investing, we can do it for you via our active portfolios. Our tactical and core cool portfolios use the insights shared in this podcast to construct and manage your investment. We blend tactical portfolios to offer our combinations of international shares, Australian shares, government bonds, and cash. We vary the asset allocation with the goal of protecting your capital in times of market uncertainty. We also have active international and Australian share portfolios. These are chosen using our quality and value investment philosophy. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. You're on. Right, so we might go, um, actually, well, let's, let's talk quickly about the company part before we go to, to some more of the drivers, because it's probably, it's an interesting, um, it's, the, it's the, the whole part about, they say, with a lot of, you know, most civilizations over time and, and as you build up sort of systems of government, um, the problem you always have is vested interests in the people who do really well out of it, um, then get in and start paying politicians or, or supporting all the politicians in order to make sure that the next group of people can't, you know, the next thing doesn't start up and it's, and so constantly you sort of look through all these different technologies over time you know um they spoke about things like the the um the spinning loom sort of coming up in 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 england because actually they didn't have really strong um guilds that they did in in other countries in france and germany and in italy so um that was why england was great for it because he didn't have all the vested interests and so that's why it took it off there and then once they were in though then they then they started paying the politicians and wanted to make sure that so the next generation came back in a different country and so there's a lot of that um, about this. And in Australia, the problem is that, um, you know, obviously that so many companies that are do- doing well from this population one in that if, say, if you're a supermarket or, or big box retailer like a, a Harvey Norman where you're selling things to people with new houses and you've actually got a bunch of the best locations. And so if you can jam more people around your store, then great, you get to sell more in your stores. And so they're all the people that are in, um, I guess, donating to our politicians. And so um, the companies that do well are the ones that keep doing well um, but the question is how long we can keep playing this out. And so, you know, I don't know, back to you, Elith, on, on companies and your thoughts on on who's benefiting and who's not. Yeah, so there's basically three three big, uh, I mean, I call them the growth lobby, who um, who love the push for this. So you've got basically, as Damo said, big business. So that's all, you know, the, your, your oligopoly enterprises love big migration. Easy way to grow your profits because you grow your customer base for more people to sell to. Yeah. You can also Re- out, retailers yeah. and property developers, not as much, you know, if you're a manufacturer or if you're no, a no. But, you know, but, doesn't help you. And yeah, but I mean, yeah. but banks would like it, but, you know, it's banks. Um, you know, ha- uh, we always see, as you said, Jerry Harvey's a classic. He, he loves immigration. Uh, high rise Harry Triggerbaugh is always talking about it. Um, you know, just, just obvious stuff. And you can also, it also means that uh, you can also put downward pressure on wages because you bring in all these people from overseas and then, you know, they, they obviously can pay for local, local workforce and, Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So you can basically get, you know, higher customer base and potentially lower wage costs. So it's win-win for them. Um, the the other crew that's that's developed in the last sort of fifteen years is uh, is the I call them the education slash migration industry. So basically, universities have now become a key rent seeker in this through the foreign student trade. So uh, our universities are untaxed. Um, we've got vice chancellors getting paid you know over a million bucks. We've got massive bureaucracies now and there where they're very high paid people. And they effectively 
um, you know, try and bring in as many foreign students as possible. Uh, don't have to provide housing for them. Don't pay tax on. They don't pay tax on the income that they get. And then, obviously, you know, the, uh, a lot of the um, the benefits get paid out to the sort of senior um, administrators, etc. So then, so, so yes, and we've had um, uh, Salvatore Vivoni come on uh, this podcast in the past. And if you want to look up some of those episodes, it talks a bit more about it. But yeah, he said big picture really is that we started with a bunch of universities who are educating, um, you know, Australian students and international students as well. We threw it open and said, you guys can bring in as many international students as, 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 you, as you like. And effectively what they did was they grew all their sales part. They, uh, all their management and admin staff all got massive pay rises and all turned into, um, as I said, you know, I think every salary went from two or 300,000 for a, for a chancellor to well over a million. So, um, and you basically just created an industry of um, people that are, that are focused, hyper-focused, not on educating, but just on bringing um, as many people in as possible and making as much money. Possible. Yeah, and it's also been facilitated by the federal government. So they, they had this thing called the Night Review uh, in the 2010s, early 2010s, and they basically said, in order to make Australia a more attractive destination for students, we're going to give away easy work, have the most generous work rights and residency in the world, and that's what they did. And yeah. surprise, surprise, we just got fire hosed with them. And, and and we saw, basically, that this this current immigration boom that we're seeing right now has been deliberately engineered by the Labor government. So right in the last year, September last year, they held the Jobs and Skills Summit, and they basically they got 100 delegates from around the country. Pretty much all of them were big Australia shields, and they came up with a fake consensus to say, we need more immigration. Surprise, surprise. And then they went ahead and loosened uh, all these visa entry uh, rules for students. Um, they extended post-study uh, work visas. They, they came out and spent $42 million to employ 600 staff in the Department of Home Affairs Immigration, basically rubber stamp as many visas as possible under this pretend 1 million visa backlog, which they made up. Um, they raised the permanent migration intake by 30 odd thousand. Uh, they raised the humanitarian intake, which I don't really have a problem with that one, but they also approved um, 66,000 these pandemic visas. So these were visas that were supposed to be handed out over the pandemic just to keep people who couldn't go home in the country for a bit longer. Labor's handed out tons of them while the pandemic's been over. All this, all this stuff, they signed two migration deals with India, to basically give them mutual um, recognition on their qualifications and also uh, longer post-study work rights, yeah. et cetera. Yeah. And so basically they've, they've, they've opened the floodgates and this is a classic reason why we're just seeing so much migration at the moment. So, I mean, I, I'm a bit disappointed. I was hoping the pandemic might have actually got us back to the migration levels we saw sort of in the early 2000s, which worked. Instead, they've gone whole hog and they've said, we lost this migration of the pandemic. Let's get it back as quickly as possible. And it's rebounded way faster than they ever imagined. Yep. And this is now, what's called the rental crosses. Yeah, sure. Now, in policy cycle circles, um, so so I guess there's this part about, okay, great, we're complaining about it. So, but And and we can see where the investment, um, who, who's benefiting from the investment side. And, and genuinely, you know, companies like Transurban are the ones that, you know, we've oh, got those in our portfolio. And so they're these ones where it's like saying, look, I don't like the effect of this, but there's... There's, there's a point where you say, well, if that's the way policy is driving and that's where it's going to keep going. So um, in policy circles, are we seeing any signs that um, of, of any pushback? I mean, there's you, you, you see a few complaints about, you know, in the tent cities and, and things like that um, uh, in the press, but it, but it doesn't seem to um, doesn't seem to have a lot of traction. I guess there's this idea that, yes, there's a rental crisis and we're running record levels of immigration, but um, linking the two seems to be beyond um, the... Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And the wit of most of the most of the commentators, and so is that. Are you seeing any signs that that might be reversing, or or is this just well, not? Well, well, yeah, certainly the coalition started to make a few noises about it, but you're right. I mean, it, it's all been about gaslighting at the moment. So basically, the the government policymakers, housing commentators, etc., all saying, all trying to claim it's a, it's a supply issue, yeah. which is the biggest load of hogwash I've ever heard. Um, so they're trying to. But they're, they're, there's a okay, chart. Can we, let's come back to that because the supply is a whole different one, and I'll, I'll yep. move back to that. So I guess I'm I'm more interested just before we get into the supply. Um, so I'm more interested in just saying, is there? Yes. Yeah, so, so so it sounds as if what you're saying, um, you said it's gaslighting. There's no real. Um, there's no sort of growing support for saying, hey, we need to wind this back. And so a lot of anger in the electorate, though. A lot of anger. Yeah. So so it looks like this is what we're. This is what we're. Um, this is what we're locked in for the, for the, for the foreseeable future. Um, as you said, the, the coalition, which is a little bit weird in that the coalition actually was running high, like they, they sort of basically say that they don't, they're not going to have immigration and crack down hard on, on illegal immigration. 
and then but then run really high levels of of legal immigration was their I guess was their modus operandi over the last um, last time they were in power. Yeah. So now, as you said, they've started to make a few noises, but but is it a commitment to lower? Do you think, or or is it a lot about saying um, if you're it feels to me that what they're effectively saying is if you're angry about the levels of immigration, vote for us and we'll do a little bit of stuff around the edges. But, you know, you're probably getting, oh, you're probably yeah, mate, I, 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 I wouldn't expect I wouldn't expect a revolution here. I mean, yeah. look, 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 it's true. The last last two Labor governments, so this one and the previous one, have ran higher immigration than the coalitions, mm. but not that much. Like, it's, yeah. you know, we're talking about it's it's like big Australia or, or massive Australia. Right. Uh, yeah. So it's like, you know, pick your poison. Um, yeah. You know, and, and, and it's pretty, pretty easy to argue just to, just for a bit lower, yeah. you know, but it's still and, and historically be massive. Yeah, and neither of them are saying we're going to revolutionise the way supplies, um, you know, we're, we're, you know, we're going to go out and build all this extra supply or, or do something, you know. They're, they're all just saying, um, yeah, there's a problem, it's not our fault, blame on it. Blame blame, blame, blame blame local governments, blame NIMBYs, whatever. Yeah. yeah. But there's no real Yeah. So 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 as bad as as bad as what we're taking as bad as um what you're saying is from an investment perspective, um, this is a, this is what we've this is a hand we've been dealt. We've got to play that hand. Um, you know, we wish we had a different hand, but um it doesn't look like that's anything's changed. No, no, of course not. And look, you know, again it gets down to these we've got just such big lobby groups that are involved, mm. you know, pushing this stuff. And also, unfortunately, Australia can't debate this stuff because as soon as you do it, you call it a racist. And yeah. it's just this, it, it, it's just stupid. Like, it's, we're talking about numbers here. So why can't you debate a number? Yeah. <laughs> it's just ridiculous. But anyway, yeah, so, so, that, so, so, we're, so we're basically locked in, unfortunately. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let's, let's go to supply then. So, so what's happening on the supply front? Yeah. So anyway, there, there, there's, there's some charts here. Um, so basically, obviously, we've got record migration flows, record number, driven by record numbers of students that were off the charts we haven't seen before. And at the same time, as we've got this record immigration, um, I've done a chart here comparing, uh, comparing dwelling completion, completions versus population change. Actual supply levels have tanked to basically, you know, decade lows. So it's going all the wrong way. And of course, um, I've got a nice chart there too. This is for Shane Oliver, just showing that basically rent, rents have gone through the roof. It's actually higher than what he's got in that rent. Actually, so before, before you get to that one, can we just talk about this dwelling completions one? So, yep. um, so just big picture terms, uh, we've got about 2.1 or 2.2 people per house. I think it's about right, isn't it? Maybe it might have been a little bit higher than that. It's higher than that. It's 2.5. Yeah, like 10 million houses. Yeah, 10 million houses and 25 million people. 26 million. Yeah, 26 million. yeah close. 2, 2.5, 2.6. So, so if we're going to bring in 500,000 people um, you want to be building about two, two hundred thousand. You've also got to account for natural population increase too, though. So, so basically, it's more like running over six hundred at the moment. Right. Okay. Okay. So we, so we, so in order just to keep run still, we sh we should be building um, two hundred and fifty odd houses, maybe to, to 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 keep up with where we are at the moment. Yeah, and you also got to account for demolitions too, because about eight percent of uh, houses completion. Uh, uh, right, not uh, in a rebuild. Knockdowns. Yeah, yeah, okay, reset. Yeah, so. yeah, so you should trap one and add one. Okay, so so okay, so if that's the case, um, uh, yeah, so maybe we want to be running at um, yeah, closer to three hundred thousand. Yeah, and we're running at one seventy. So we should we're almost we're about half the number that we need to be. Well, maybe not half, but probably. Forty percent lower than what we need to be. Yeah, and and just the the, the highest Australia's only ever built over two hundred twenty thousand homes once, and that was in uh, twenty sixteen. I think we built uh, two hundred twenty three thousand, and you can see that in the chart on the left, the blue line, yeah. um, dwelling completions. Now, this whole notion that it's a supply issue <laughs> is a bit of a laugh to me because, as you can see, we had an unprecedented building boom last decade, as shown in the blue line. Problem is, we had, you know. 10 years before that, the, the population growth had surged with immigration. So it's actually a demand issue uh, just through yeah. it's too high immigration. Well, well, and in big picture sense, so as well. So um, so we had this level of population. As, as you see, this blue line, you know, if you draw a line through that and you go, okay, it's sort of 150 odd thousand houses or whatever that was that was being built. And then you go, okay, now we double the, the population in, two, in the 2000s. So we need to sort of. Um, uh, that needs to ramp up to sort of two hundred thousand or whatever it is, um, which it sort of does, and then okay. now we've doubled again. So you'd actually sort of expect that line needs to go from two hundred, as you said, to to closer to three hundred. But instead of going instead of going up, it's going the opposite direction. 
Yeah, and obviously the the, the homes we built in the um, last decade when we had that boom were mostly apartments, right? So they don't hold as many people. A lot of machine box, obviously yeah. very poor quality. <laughs> like, you know, we've heard about these flammable cladding, Balpier mm-hmm. defects, uh, mascot, um, opal towers, all these sorts of things. So this is, a, again, this is another problem. If you want to ramp up housing supply, you want to do it super quickly, you're going to have to have great quality. And we saw that last decade. So if we're going to do it again, you're going to get poor quality again. Mm-hmm. That's just the way, that's the way it works. Um, yeah. If you're going to fire hose a place with, with building, you're going to cut corners. And that's yeah. what we got. So again, it's like the solution here is just temper. You know, the, the whole solution okay. to the housing crisis is pretty damn simple. Yeah. The immigration program that is below the nation's ability to supply housing and infrastructure as well as safeguard the environment. Yeah. And we haven't, we're not anywhere near that. We are so okay. far beyond that. But, and, and, and just, um, and, and Leith, you obviously write a lot about this on macro business for anyone who wants to get more, like, yeah, hit that up. Um, but I guess the, cause, cause for me, the, the part I'm looking at here is going, okay, well, we need, like, it, it looks like we're locked into saying there's going to have to be a, um, uh, just, just based on where we are today, we, we need a, we need a, a, a dwelling boom in terms of how construction boom. Um, we're not going to get it. That's not coming. So if we don't get it, then we're looking at much higher, higher, higher house prices and much higher rents. Homes. Um, yep. Yeah. All of it. Uh, and, 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 and Damon, just to drop, so the, the reason why we're not going to get it is pretty simple. We've got obviously higher interest rates, which makes it hard. We've got builders that folded left, right and center. So we've actually got less capacity. We've got obviously structurally higher materials costs now because of this inflation we've had. Um, you know, we, yeah, materials inflation has come down, but it's still high. And so it structurally costs more to build a, build a home than it did, you know, two years ago. So that's going to obviously creep supply. And we've got a shortage of builders. Yeah. Um, so the whole whole supply side is basically, you know, constipated at the same time as we're fire hosing demand. So this whole notion, well, so, so the federal government actually, National Cabinet two months ago, said that it came up with this brain fart uh, that they're going to build 1.2 million homes in five years. So that's 240,000 homes a year. Now to get that, we're at, we're at 170 at the moment, right? So we're 70,000 below that annual figure, the run rate. We've only ever built over 220,000 once. We built 223,000. So we're going to magically, over the next five years, ramp up construction to a level we've never seen before at a time when we've got structurally high interest rates, structurally high uh, fine, um, you know, materials costs, shortage of labor, mm. and we've got less construction firms to actually build it. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to know that this is an absolute joke and that the housing crisis is going to get worse. Yeah. But it's calling straight. Yeah. No, no, no. I think, and, and so, so from a, like, the, and there's a couple of effects from here is that for, for investors is, as we look at this is, is that, okay, so there's a, there's a macroeconomic part, which is saying, um, people who have existing houses, their house prices go up, existing landlords, their, their rents go up. Um, and so that, that's a, a group that benefits from that. Um, and then there's a, there's the everyone else. Um, uh, so, so if you, we sort of split our economy into into thirds, I think as as, um, as they like to say, you know, you've got a third renters, a third owners with little or no mortgage, and a third with mortgages. And so, what we're looking at is that the third with mortgages and the third that are renting are going to cop it, and the um, the, the the other third that that don't have are going to do well out of it. And they're generally chances, older. Chances are they're the older. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. We've got the older, and so. Um, which who tend to spend less. So in terms of demand, in terms of, um, yeah, you'd expect that demand overall in that scenario is going to be lower for, for consumer goods and, and, and other things juiced by the fact. So, so that's from existing people juiced by the fact you're actually going to have a, all this record immigration through. So that's going to, that's going to offset that. So, so maybe, you know, net, net, you look at sort of discretionary consumers and go, yeah, maybe that's actually a slight positive for them in that everybody's buying less, but actually there's a lot more people and, and so the net effect is maybe a little bit better. Um, and then though from a, um, uh, yeah. And then, and then from a, from an overall part is that, that per capita is going to be pretty bad, but actually the, the gross amount might be all right. So, so yeah. And then, which sort of speaks to more political instability, you know, we've had enough, yeah. had a lot of different prime ministers over the last, uh, the last 10 years and, and, um, yeah, it sounds like- it, it does look like this current administration is following the path of Kevin Rudd. Right, so you know, Kevin Rudd was popular for about a year or so, and then, and then obviously he said, "I'm a big supporter of a big Australia," and it was like, mm. plus the plus obviously the mining tax debacle. But 
um, yeah, it does seem to be similar to that, but uh, you're 100% right. Um, we've got, obviously, the, the economy is growing very weakly at the moment, but we are in a per capita recession, so we're two consecutive quarters of negative growth. We've got household cons- uh, household consumption is growing very modestly, but again, it's negative when you adjust for, um, you know, well, population like- growth. Oh, well, sorry, sorry. sorry. So, yes, I'm talking about real household consumption. Oh, okay, yep, yep. Yeah, and uh, same with retail sales. Uh, all this stuff is going backwards once you adjust for that population growth. So basically, the, the overall economy pie is growing pretty pretty poorly, but everyone's slice of the pie is shrinking. And that's basically a recipe for, um, for you know, political discontent. And we've seen it with, um, you know, our <laughs> treasurer, Jim Chalmers, has basically been gaslighting everyone, saying that, uh, boasting that they've had the highest wage growth in a decade when actually... Real wages have fallen back to 2009 levels. Yeah. Uh, right. Like stupid. Well, and then he's also boasted that we've created five, half a million jobs in the last year. We're naturally, we've had more immigration, uh, you know, more more labor supply. Because also, not just yeah. immigration, we've also had obviously cost, cost all those baby bonus kids and now turn at old age. Yeah. He's yeah. also added the housing market. Yeah. Um, so what he's saying is that he's, he's, not, he's not lying in saying we've got the highest wage growth. Lying. But what he's pretty but dishonest. The highest wage growth in terms of nominal wage growth. But what he's saying is lying. Yeah, because yeah, such, no, no one yeah. ever talks about this stuff in... Uh, yeah, in you're running such high re- levels of, uh, of of inflation that, yeah, you're actually... Oh, I, um, yeah. I, mean, I, I personally think he's lying because we should be talking about it in real terms. But, but I guess he's been... Uh, he's been um, disingenuous. Disingenuous, yeah, that, that, yeah. That's probably the fairer way of saying it. That I, yeah. that I, that I call it lying. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, no, back, back, back to you, Sam. Because he knows. He knows. Yeah. Back to you, Sam, on the, another message. We'll be back again shortly. If you like what you're hearing but want a low-cost passive option, Nucleus Wealth is the first to offer passive direct indexing in Australia. The first generation of passive investing was index funds. The next gen was ETFs. Now direct indexing is here with significantly more customization and control. The benefit of direct indexing is you can add or subtract investment themes, and we have almost 100 different options to choose from. For example, you could buy an international share direct index portfolio that excludes fossil fuels and arms manufacturers and has a tilt towards cybersecurity and cloud computing. Alternatively, you could buy a portfolio with no screens and an extra exposure to nuclear power and defense contractors. You can find out more at NucleusWealth.com. Now back to the show. So we've had a, had a couple of comments come through. It's obviously a hot topic. Uh, we've got one from James John, um, and he's saying immigration is also a big problem in Europe and North America uh, with a high intake of people to countries that are in recession, uh, for example, Italy. And he's wondering if there's a directive for Western countries to take more people. Um, anyone want to comment on that one? Yeah, well, I mean, I'll, I'll comment on the uh, immigration flows. I can't comment so much about Europe, except that I know the UK is running at you know record high levels. But um, you know, Canada, for example, <laughs> if you if you're at our immigration is nuts. Canada got 1.2 million in the, over the past year, and that's obviously a country that's about 40 million people, so it's bigger than us, but not that much bigger. And um, you know, 97 percent of that 1.2 million population growth was in that overseas migration, so they're actually suffering or well, copying it even worse than us and they got a similar rental crisis they're also in a per capita recession and uh basically voter support for justin trudeau is there and the uh, La- and the liberal party which is the the equivalent of labor i guess it's basically um you know voters are revolting against um a- against that administration and he's basically under the pump and there's a big backlash brewing there uh new zealand is just so canada is a little bit ahead of us New Zealand's a bit behind us. And New Zealand has just had the highest ever immigration. And they've just got a new government coming that is basically, you know, promised to ramp it higher. So we've got this kind of Anglo, all the Anglo nations are basically going hog wild for this um, for this really high immigration. And it's causing similar problems in Canada. New Zealand's been a bit lower for a while. Uh, they're already in a per capita recession. Um, and they're going down the same path. So it's it seems to be a Anglo, you know, centric um issue that's you know, that that uh that's happening across the board yeah well that's, a, that's a, but i think us isn't running as high as it has done yeah. in the past yeah yeah there's been it's been a little bit slower there um uh yeah yes the anglo the english anglo countries are yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, i mean the ones under the uh, the ones in the cold belt that was yeah. the yeah um 
And is this is this all just a desire to boost GDP? Is is that what's driving? Well, well that's what I was, that's what I wanted to jump in in terms of you know a directive. So I mean, a, there's not a directive from a, a secret cabal controlling us. I don't believe it, so. but but um, but I do think there's a I do think politicians learn from other politicians in other countries, and I think Australia got a lot of um, uh, kudos during the during the recession during the financial crisis for for not falling into recession. Um, when really a lot of that reason why we didn't was because we brought in a record number of people. We did, yeah. It was 310,000 that year. Yeah. And I think what happened was a record. Yeah. And I think what happens is that politicians learn from that and they go, hey, no recession. So I can, you know, I can either have a, I can either prevent recessions from running good economic policy or I can just flood the, flood the market with um, immigrants and my corporate sponsors will love it. And corporate corporations, obviously they learn as well. So, so corporations, um, yeah, my operations in Australia went really well because, you know, we flooded, I had the few good store locations and then they, all of a sudden the population around those stores doubled. And so I sold more stuff. Um, and so let me try and convince, um, politicians elsewhere to do the same thing. And so, um, yeah, so I think in terms of directives, no, I don't think there's any directives, but I do think there's, um, the incentives for politicians to do it and the incentives for, um, corporates to, um, to, to pay politicians to, to have those policies or, or, you know, I guess to maybe not pay, pay might be overstating it, but certainly to, to direct donations to come to, to politicians who will support those policies um, means that uh, yeah, a lot of Western countries, I think have got that similar, um, similar incentives. It's a lazy way to grow. So it's an easy way to, you know, paper over the cracks. Yeah, that's right. And we know politicians yeah, it's just been, always take the easy route. Yeah, exactly. So prices. Let's talk about prices. Yeah. Okay. Now, um, basically, <laughs> this this immigration boom's basically broken pretty much all house price models. So, um, you know, before uh, a year or so ago, the RBA released research and you know their own modelling, and uh, I think Chris Joy at Coolabar Capital's done his own, and etc. And they all pretty much showed that if interest rates rise by, I think it was three hundred basis points at the time, um, we basically get a fifteen to twenty percent fall in in house prices. And that was, it seems pretty logical, right? If you lift interest rates, basically borrowing capacity shrinks and also obviously the cost of financing goes up. So that reduces demand directly. Now, you know, obviously we've had 400 basis points of um, official cat rate, cash rate rises. Actual mortgage, average mortgage rates in Australia have risen by almost, well, one of the highest in the world because we've got so many very rate mortgages and short term fixed rate. So we've seen, um, you know, average mortgage rates rise by nearly 300 basis points. And based on that, you know, I, I was one of them as well. I was expecting not necessarily 20%, but, you know, expecting a pretty hefty house price fall. And instead, guess what? House prices are back to their uh, peak before uh, the RBA started hiking last year. And it's basically caught everyone off guard, except for, you know, say, Stephen Kukul. So i got to give the guy his flowers. He, um, he, he, he was one of the guys pushing back against this. And um, basically, we've got, despite the fact we've had such high monetary tightening, borrowing capacity shrunk by 30%. House prices are basically back at their peak, and it's all because we've got this massive shortage of supply. Um, you know, and and you know, the actual uh, listings, the you know, number of listings has has fallen, uh, shrunk, running way behind at you know twenty five percent below the five year average. At the same time as we've obviously got all this extra demand through immigration, we've got soaring rents, so that's created FOMO because people who either can't find rental properties or uh, seeing this huge inflation are basically encouraged to try and, you know, stretch themselves to buy, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's really counterintuitive. And, it, and it's one of the uh, very few booms in the last 30 years, or sorry, house price rises in the last 30 years, cycles, that have gone against the interest rate. So usually it takes interest rate cuts and borrowing capacity to rise before you get a house price rebound. This time is unusual in that we've had quite a strong rebound despite the fact that, you know, interest rates have gone up so aggressively and quickly. And we're still, you know, arguably this average mortgage rates are still going up because we've got people still rolling off these cheap pandemic fixed rate mortgages. Uh, so it, it, it is it is a scenario I've never seen before and I wouldn't have picked it uh, mm. a year ago in a million years. Uh, yeah. But then again, I wouldn't have picked this level of immigration a year ago. <laughs> it's, it's off the charts. Okay, so so let's go to um, what that means. So, so you spoke a little bit about the mortgage rates, and, and it's worth coming back to considering for Australia the 
the fact that we have a different structure to our to our market than the rest of the world. And so you've got a chart up here from the uh, from the uh, one of the RBA oh, rates. Yeah. yeah, just sort of showing how the policy rates have risen. So say the US, you know, from zero up to to um, a five percent over five percent, uh, whereas Australia is sort of capped out at at four percent. But when you look at the next chart, which is what what's the rate that that um, consumers are paying, you can see Australia is actually right at the top. So Australia's at, US the, bottom is at the bottom. Of, yeah, we're at the bottom of one of these and at the top of the other. And, and yeah, the US because they have thirty year mortgages, um, and even the UK where um, you know, the average mortgage tenor is a lot longer, um, you can see they're still um, yeah, there's still been a, a much smaller change in the mortgage rate um, in both those countries. And what that means is that obviously Australia Australia is one of the most interest rate sensitive countries in the world um, because we've got so many variable rate mortgages, but also because we we hold the second highest debt load in the world. For our households have got the second highest debt um, in the world behind Switzerland. So if you look at the Bank for International Settlements data, so we've got very highly indebted households and we've got a very high share of variable rate mortgages. And because of that, that makes us really sensitive to interest rate rises. And because of that, that means that house prices should have fallen if you trust the models um, based on this, you know, huge shrinkage in borrowing capacity and and also uh, et cetera, et cetera. So, but instead, they've they've rebounded back to the peak already, which is um, extraordinary. I didn't think I'd see this in my lifetime. I might never see it again. Yeah. Um, okay. So I might jump to some of the just some of the uh, affordability stats that we we run. Uh, and I'll have an updated version of this in the next uh, day or two. Um, so, if, so just to put this in perspective, so the way we tend to look at it from the investment side is uh, is trying to get a feel for, you know, what are the what are the alternatives. So, so the your original type of things with houses about saying, well, it's all about the yield and and the return you're getting on the house, sort of what goes out the door a little bit because. If there's an investment return you can expect to get on an asset based on you know how how much is the um, uh, what type of yield are you getting on it and, and how much is how fast is that yield growing um, so that's how you value most <laughs> most traditional assets the problem with houses is people have to live somewhere and so that's sort of got a, you've got this overlying part which is you know part investment part um, lifestyle and then so then what we've done is separated into sort of three different parts and said this is well in, in our view is going to drive house prices. And as Lee said, that sort of the, you know, um, the immigration side sort of throws 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 a, a spanner in this works. But but you basically say for one side is is saying the first part I look at is is what's what's your mortgage payment versus your median wage. So and can people actually afford to to pay for mortgages? And so uh, if we're looking at Sydney houses at the moment. Um, we're at one hundred percent. So basically, it's cracked the triple digits. So your your median wage in Sydney um, will will meet your median wage payment and so with with nothing left so you obviously need and then sorry this is pre-tax as well so 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 yes yeah, so it's um at that stage you, you you're far beyond affordable you know the the in the history uh you know we peaked out the last time when there was sort of 17 18 percent mortgage rates in back in the uh back in the 80s it sort of peaked out at 70 percent 75 percent ish um and the typical level is is sort of 50 closer to 50 percent so um yeah affordability is, is certainly on that front, is is it never seen before levels? Um, and look, Sydney is the worst of the markets, but it, but it's a similar trend you see around around the rest of the cities, and you can grab all that data from from our our report. Um, on in terms of mortgage payments, so that's the other one we look at: mortgage payment versus rent. And this is this idea that's saying, well, um, when people look at what they're going to what they're going to buy or what they what they're not going to buy, is it's the idea if if I'm paying a thousand dollars a week in rent and I can buy a place. For and, and get a mortgage that's going to cost me eight hundred dollars a week, then then I'm incentivized to do it. If it's going to cost me you know, three thousand uh, um, dollars in uh, in in mortgage costs, then then I'm less likely to to want to um to want to take the mortgage out. So uh, yeah, sit on that basis. Uh, Sydney sort of you know it seems it bottoms out around about a hundred percent. Um, so basically, whatever the the cost of a mortgage gets um below the cost of renting, it seems to seems to flip the other way, and you and you get um. Uh, get, you get that price rises, and in the past, it's it's topped out around about one hundred and seventy percent. Um, in terms of yeah, so that basically saying a mortgage would be seventy percent more expensive. So if I'm paying a thousand dollars a week for rent, um, you know, a, an equivalent mortgage would be a thousand seven hundred a week. Is is where it sort of tops out at the top of every other cycle. 
we're well over two hundred percent in Sydney, um, but the uh, the rapidly rising um, rents has sort of improved that number. I guess and made it made it look better, I suppose, in a way. But it's still at sort of well, it's it's at the ninety ninth percentile. So extraordinarily expensive on both those measures. And the final one, which we think's important but less important, is is this idea of the property price to the median wage, and, and the reason why. Um, you look at that is saying, well, people have to be able to afford a deposit. Um, but once you've got the deposit and whether you get that from, you know, beg, borrowing, stealing, bank of mum and dad, whatever it is, um, the top two are the more important about, can you keep it going? Um, the, the, the first part is, is, is sort of important in terms of about in, um, that the property price, but, it, but far less important than, than can you, can you get, keep up with the up ongoing payments? And at that point, that's. Yeah, a little bit lower than its peaks, but it's still certainly um, certainly pretty high. Uh, if you look at Sydney units on a similar basis, so um, they're sort of running at about 50%. Of, so that's actually hasn't reached, the units haven't reached the same height. So if you look at medium units versus the median wage, they haven't reached the heights you did in, in, the, in the 80s, late 80s. But having said that, um, a lot fewer units in, in the late 80s and, and a lot more now. So, you know, you, you do have to take a little bit with a grain of salt. So, I mean, it looks expensive uh, on this basis, but it's not like record expensive the way the way houses are. Uh, and then, if you look at the rental growth side again, it's it's um so yeah sorry what's your what's your mortgage versus a uh, versus the median wage again it's expensive but it's not it's not at the hundredth percentile it's sort of the eighty third percentile so you said yeah it's quite expensive but not not dramatically so on on the um on the unit side. Uh, yeah, so that's, I've got um, uh, investment measures. I'll just touch on the investment measures. So this is where you go. What's your gross yield? So so gross yield. I'll keep in mind doesn't include um, uh, all your running costs and and things like that. So that sort of ends up once you get yeah you know, once you you knock those off. Um, it's pretty close to negative on on city houses, but yeah. So so, so we're at three percent. Um, uh. On that, and sorry, and it also doesn't count. Um, the other thing to, to remember with with all whatever you're looking at these as an investment measure is that houses have this, um, uh, houses and apartments have this uh, ongoing depreciation issue. In that, yeah, okay, I put a new kitchen in and it cost me twenty grand to put a new kitchen in, but that's depreciated every year. And in ten years, I don't put a new kitchen in and carpets and all that type of stuff like that. And you don't see those in these yields, so it's not like a yeah, it's not, it's not fully reflective of those. Um, if you look at the yield less the mortgage rate. Um, it's uh, it's not as terrible, I suppose. Um, but it but it's still not good. It's sort of like now you're running at negative four percent. Um, so so basically, what I'm saying is yields about four percent lower than the mortgage rate. Uh, which that's a that's only slightly below average. We've quite quite often have we seen yields far below the mortgage rate. Um, but so it's not sort of particularly atypical where we are. But it's um, it's not on a, on an absolute measure. It's not particularly good. So, so really, um, I guess what I'm saying, and I've got similar measures for the for for units there, which look a little bit better, but but not particularly, um, is that you know from an investment perspective, it really is a um, a bet on capital appreciation still. So you know if, if you want to invest in um, you know the next little while in, in houses, uh, you know, from the from looking at yields and and returns on those, uh, they don't look particularly attractive. But if you've got the view that actually the people are going to keep pouring in and, and you can't build it fast enough. And so um, this is going to be forced up from that perspective. Then the, the current rates aren't, they're not at all time, not at all time lows. Yeah. Okay. Uh, now we have our question of the week. So this is for viewers to have some discussion in the comment section over the coming days. So the question for this week is, are there any signs that immigration will slow? So feel free to post your thoughts and engage with us and some of the other viewers over the coming days. Uh, Leith, I think we know your answer already. No, no, look, honestly, I think it probably will slow a little bit, but it's going to be it's going to remain at high levels is what I'll say. Mm -hmm. I mean, it can't, can't remain at the current pace, but, you know, it's going to turn, but it's going to be very high. Yeah, but and and so you'll have the, uh, you'll have an announcement at some stage where you, Leith, that, that Elbow will come out and say, there's a rental crisis going on, I'm going to slice... Uh, I'm going to slice immigration. I'm going to take a hundred thousand people a year out of out of our current thing. And Still be back to at record levels, exactly, uh, <laughs> excluding the level we just had. D double, double, what, bubble what it was over the prior periods or whatever. Yeah, like yeah. That. So they, we get so like that. They can do that a lot of times. Yeah. So um, yeah, 
And so investment implications uh, for me um, is really about, it, it's about the consumer discretionary side and, and saying that, look, where are we you know, picking the points in the cycle? So, so are we going into a, a stage in the next year or so where we will see um, recessionary implications and, and there's, there's, so we've got this short-term issue about, you know, is there a, will there a way to be recession within Australia and, and the, the ongoing factors. Beyond that though, and, and, and sort of looking over a longer term, longer term, and if you're talking about it, you know, accumulating um, assets into your portfolio and, and sort of averaging over time, is that um, based on where the current policy settings, there still is some support for some of these more um, discretionary retail. Um, with again, just making sure I've got that disclaimer that in the short term that you got some, you might, you may well have some issues over the next year or so. Um, but discretion, the longer term pressures are that um, until we see a change in these policies, which don't look likely, um, they'll still benefit. Uh, similarly, with some of your utilities, um, things like Transurban and, and and ones like that, in terms of people who will benefit from this population crush. Um, so a lot of it's the people who, who sort of benefited before. Um, obviously, there's there's timing and prices and and all those types of things you need to look at. Uh, in terms of overall Australian economic um, growth, you know, it does um, we do have concerns about the level of bankruptcies and, and a few and other factors coming on coming over the next year or so. Um, but beyond that, over a sort of five or ten year period, um, it does look like a reasonably um, conducive investment environment in terms of um, you know, will we see profit? Will we see companies manage to grow their profitability on the back of crush floating? And, and so, is, is it good for individuals? No, it's bad for individuals. But will we see that, you know, will the net effect of that be, um, you know, a broader economic growth because you are jam-packing people in and, and existing companies will benefit from that. So, um, yeah, uh, Leith, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on... I, I, I just laughed when you said, you know... Um, profit Bad for individuals, uh, good for companies. Or, no, no, well, yeah, or, or profiting from crush loading. That, that just sums it up beautifully. Yeah. Yeah, and uh, just, just one other thing I want to add in, guys. Uh, the viewers would have heard we have around 100 different screens and tilts, so you can either add things into the portfolio or take them out of the portfolio. So, you know, if you're bearish on the Australian economy in the short term, uh, you can exclude Australian shares from the multi-asset portfolios. Uh, you can exclude Australian banks and limit housing Australian housing exposure. If you're bullish on the Australian economy over the long term, uh, we do have two portfolios uh, specifically uh, targeted to Australian equities. So there's a core Australia portfolio, which is an actively managed portfolio, and also the Australian leaders, which is the direct index passive portfolio. Uh, so yeah, feel free to check those out on uh, nucleuswealth.com as well. And, and in both those, you can add or subtract things as well. So if you want to add, add extra exposure to particular sectors, consumer discretionary or something like that, you can add that in or, or take it out. Are you how you see things. Excellent. Uh, so that pretty much wraps us up for today. So uh, Leith, Damo, thank you as always for sharing your views. Uh, I'm sure they resonate with many people out there. And um, yeah, we look forward to having having you on again soon, Leith, and uh, continuing to tell the story. Cheers. Anytime, guys. Just, give me, just send up the bat signal. <laughs> Excellent. Um, thanks, guys. So we do welcome your feedback on this podcast, especially in regards to suggestions for future topics. If you do have any ideas, please drop it in the comment section below, or you can send us an email at contact at nucleuswealth.com. Uh, also, if you know of anyone that might get some value out of today's episode, we'd really appreciate it if you do share it with them. Um, so that pretty much wraps us up for today. So from myself, Damien, Leith, and the rest of the team at Nucleus Wealth, thanks for watching, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Bye for now.